Welcome everyone to the, is this the third? Uh, fourth. Production safety, fourth production safety task force roundtable. I trust all your friends and families are well or recovering. Um, we started this task force to discuss to, how to move our industry forward into a place where we had one industry-wide guideline for COVID safety protocols that we could all follow. Um, since that didn't seem to be happening, um, and there are a lot of us going back to work. Raise your hand if you're going back to work soon. We start Sunday, everyone's working. <laughs> um, we, uh, we decided that the PGA should take all the good work that this task force has been collecting um, over the last umpteen months and put it together into one document that can be a series of documents for a producer working in a non-studio environment that you can use as a guideline for safely planning your productions. In other words, this is specifically for producers working on independent productions. So, and to recap, for those of you who hadn't joined us before, the um, documents are a summary of the AMPTP document and the way forward documents, um, but they're written specifically from the point of view of producers. So there'll be um, a summary, a green light questionnaire and pre-production recommendations a red light protocol that we're gonna go through tonight. What, what happens if somebody tests positive or is having symptoms of COVID-19 on set? Um, there's a clear health and safety supervisor and uh, health and safety manager job description. There's budgetary guidelines, codes of conduct for both the crew and the producing team, and notes from the field, which are suggestions and helpful hints um, from other producers that are out there right now working in the field and giving us some guidance. Um, we're hoping Susan, to officially <laughs> release these documents, I think Wednesday next week. Um, we're we're going to be sending them out to the other unions and, um, and guilds to get their thumbs up. Obviously, as a word of caution, these are just guidelines. Everyone still needs to do their own production safety plan and get their own advice from their own council. And if you're asked to work on a production, you should review the producer's plan and make sure that the plan provides what makes you feel comfortable to go back to work. Um, so these documents were only possible by the hard work of many, all of the people that you see on the screen and a lot of people who are on production right now and couldn't make it tonight. So um, I first like to start um, by calling out everyone to introduce themselves. I will start with Susan Sprung. You're on mute, Ms. Sprung. Sorry. Uh, Susan Sprung. Uh, I'm one of the two national executive directors and chief operating officers of the Guild. And I just want to say that work that the task force has done is really incredible. And the entire Guild is indebted to you guys. So thank you. Michelle. Michelle Bird, Associate National Executive Director. And thank you all. Harvey. Hi, Harvey Wilson. I'm uh, uh, an EIC and line producer working out of LA now after uh, for the last four years and uh, formerly on the board of delegates for the Producers Council and uh, enjoying this wonderful group of people I've been working with here. Thanks, Harvey. Gary? I am Gary Lucchese. I'm uh, uh, President Emeritus along with Laurie McCreary. She and uh, Laurie and I served as presidents of the Producers Guild from 20, 2014 to 2018, I think, wasn't that right? Those four years. And uh, we're still we're still active in the Guild, so I'm happy to be on this board. Jen. Hi, guys. Jen here, a line producer, DGA UPM. I've been working with the Guild since about 2013 on their production safety initiative to help educate members like you on best uh, practices for safe productions. <laughs> Thanks. Yolanda. Hi, Yolanda Cochran. I serve on the National Board of Directors as well as the steering committee for One Guild Initiative. Uh, I'm a producer and also an executive working um, at Nickelodeon in Awesomeness Studios. Thank you. Kyle, can you blip on and say hi? Um, hi, Kyle Katz, Director of Member Services. <laughs> 
Sorry, I should have warned you. It's okay. From the West, hop in from the West Coast. And Diana. Hi everyone, Diana White, Manager of Member Services and Events based on the East Coast. Thank you, Diana and Kyle help us put all this whole thing together. And Michelle and Susan take our hundreds of emails from this task force uh, asking multiple questions about what we can and can't say. And then Harvey, Gary, Jen, Yolanda, and another group of about 10 other producers literally have worked for the last three and a half months tirelessly on these documents. So I'm hoping um, when you see them, I think when you see them, you'll realize how much work has gone into it, but it is because of these amazing people who are doing it in their spare time, putting these together. So what we're gonna do is go through the red light process. Um, each of us is gonna take a section um, and review it, and then we'll put up a kind of a flow chart so you can see what you might get in the packet next week, hopefully next week. And, um, and then we'll open it to questions. And if you have questions along the way, um, you can throw those into the Q&A and we'll try to get them as well. So um, the, the red light process um, is really about um, what happens when you're on a production or in prep on a production and an employee, a crew member tests positive for COVID-19. So we have a lot of different steps that you take. It includes isolation, workplace sanitization, retesting, because we've heard of a lot of people that have had um, what do we call it? A false positive result. Um, privacy concerns, communication, contact tracing, replacement, and in the, in the case that you might have to halt production, how to halt production and start it back up. So I am going to throw this to Jen to start with exhibiting sis, uh, symptoms. All right. So so yeah, so if you have gone back to production, you're up and shooting and uh, a team member is, has been identified as exhibiting sy symptoms, you're going to go through the process as um, Lori just described. So there's going to be individual steps that will apply if someone's exhibiting symptoms, starting with an isolation process, a workplace sanitization process, retesting, um, and contact tracing, all right? So that's, that's your step one. So this whole thing is to kind of give you a checklist as you go through, if this happens, how do you react to that? So if someone tests positive, if a team member tests positive, um, you must notify the health and, safety, health and safety supervisor and producer immediately that someone has tested positive. Um, for confidentiality purposes, uh, the name should be kept as confidential as possible. However, um, definitely need to know that someone has tested positive on the cast or crew. So depending on when in your process someone has tested positive, whether or not it's before they've even started work, uh, whether or not uh, you, you started production and you're doing your pre-hiring testing, or whether or not they um, have arrived uh, for, the, for, the, for work on the day, or if it's during principal photography, there's steps to follow with each of those scenarios. So if they have tested positive before their first day, a week, uh, first day of work, uh, the team member must not report to work. Um, and you definitely want to follow retesting procedures until the employee tests negative. So I'm just gonna go through these, these quick bullet points, but all of these steps have additional steps that the, that the team is gonna go through tonight uh, to help you uh, identify the process. Uh, if a team member uh, tests positive before arriving to work on any day, so you're already up into production, you're already working, but they haven't showed up for their call time yet, Team member must not report to work. Follow the retesting procedures until that employee tests negative. So same as before their first day of work. If it's during principal photography and they are physically on set and they get a test result back that they've tested positive or they've ident been identified as exhibiting certain symptoms, you wanna immediately enact the isolation protocols that we'll get into next. Um, again, notify your health and safety supervisor, producer, and potentially the immediate supervisor or department head that an employee has tested positive. Follow the retesting protocols, the workplace sanitation protocols, contact tracing protocols, and the privacy and communication protocols. Um, definitely check with your, uh, I say definitely a lot, sorry, uh, <laughs> your local county health department for protocols regarding the number of concurrent uh, positive team members that require a production to shut down. So 
I think in LA County, if it's more than uh, three that test positive, you do need to notify the county of that. All right. Yeah, I think you need to notify the county and shut down for a minimum of, it might be 14 days in LA County. So it's really important to, to have all of these uh, documented uh, procedures. So Gary's gonna talk through isolation and workplace sanitization. Gary, you're uh, muted. Sorry. So if you think about it, um, you want to be really prepared if, if somebody, if you, if you have a problem on the set. So the health and safety supervisor has to designate a discrete isolation room for all production workplaces, you know, on location, on stages, workshops, production offices, so that if somebody does contact, if somebody is identified as being positive, that you have a place that you can put them. Okay. Uh, we have to ensure that there's private transportation that has to be available to take the positive team member home. We have to, the positive team member must uh, immediately be fitted with proper PPE gear, if not already. Um, the, 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 the PTM, the, 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 the uh, PPE must be disposed of by a trained sanitation and medical worker and immediately have to isolate, isolate the positive team member and their personal property and gear in the isolation room and arrange for the positive team member to take private transportation home if not already there. So, uh, and in an instance of a positive test and retest, the positive team member must re remain in isolation for a minimum of 14 days. At the end of the 14 days, a team member may return to work provided that they meet the following conditions. They've completed two negative PCR tests three days apart They've been cleared by a medical professional. They're not exhibiting any symptoms and they are 24 hours fever free. Uh, also, uh, we have to ensure that there, there's workplace sanita sanitization at all times and the health and safety supervisor is, is there to arrange for immediate sanitize, sanitize, sanita, sanitize, whatever. It's a hard is. word. It's a really hard word. Sanitization. Sanitization of the, of the positive testing members, workplace tools, equipment, and work areas, as well as any places identified by contact tracing. As you can imagine, this means that you, um, your health and uh, safety supervisor and manager need to pretty much know where all crew members are, what places that they visited, and what other uh, crew members they've come in contact with. So that's a very important part of it. And, and, and we would have to presume that that health and safety supervisor would go around and, and monitor those isolation areas uh, every workday just to make sure that they're ready just in case you need them. Right. And um, so Carol uh, Mazzoni is asking how many crew members need to test positive for production to have a shutdown in New York? And is it also a 14 day shutdown? I don't, do any of you got, you know that? Does anyone on the, on the Zoom know that? If you do, can you throw it into the uh, Q and A or? Chat? No, I don't know. We'll have to research it and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, we know the California answer though, right, Lori? Yeah, to California, it's three or more in, right. in, in, at the same, in the same incident. So, um, Harvey, you're going to go through retesting and privacy and communication. Okay. Uh, retesting. Um, the uh, positive team members should immediately be retested and provided with information uh, on how to contact an authorized medical professional for immediate assessment. Um, upon retesting, um, from PCR testing, which is the, uh, the brain lobotomy uh, <laughs> testing, um, uh, they, if they're positive, the individual may not return to work until cleared by a doctor and completed two negative PCR test tests three days apart. If it's negative, they should immediately do a rapid antigen test, which is either a, a shallow nasal swab or, or a saliva test. Um, and that must be administered. If the antigen test is negative, and uh, that is a second PCR test is negative and an antigen test is negative, then the individual may return to work. If the antigen test is positive, the individual still may not return to work until cleared by a doctor and have completed at least two negative PCR tests three days apart. That's been set up, the timing of all that has been set up based on um, the incubation period and the number of days that an, uh, a team member or a person may be shedding the virus. 
which is um, up to 14 days past the initial infection. And if I could just add something, Harvey, the, yeah. the issue here is that you're trying to make sure that, the, that a false positive doesn't create havoc on your set. So you're retesting to make sure that it's actually positive or that there's a, a better than good chance that it is that it is positive. So sometimes the tests, you know, they're 90 plus percent accurate. That means you take a hundred tests, the 10 of them might be false positive. So that's the, that's the reason for retesting right away because God forbid an actor or your director test positive, you don't want to have to shut down if you don't have to. Correct. Now, as far as privacy and communication, the producer should take uh, care to not, to keep the uh, identity of the individual uh, and the test results private uh, to the best of their ability. Obviously, if someone disappears from set, people will know, but um, you still are uh, obligated not to provide that information um, uh, given the above protocols. So as soon as the positive team member has been removed from the pre premises, producers should arrange for an AD uh, or the health and safety supervisor led safety briefing to announce that a team member has tested positive or has been sent home with COVID symptoms. Uh, the producer should reinforce their commitment to safety and provide assurance that every precaution is being taken to ensure safety of the rest of the team members. And any cast or crew member who is uncomfortable may voluntarily leave work for the day without recourse or without, and without pay from time of voluntary dismissal. So obviously, you know, all that is, is subject to negotiations, but um, it's uh, very important that people feel safe on set and that you give them the opportunity to feel safe. And lastly, producers should encourage anyone with questions to ask them uh, at the safety meeting or in, um, uh, or in private, um, obviously, as necessary. Um, it's, it's really absolutely um, uh, important that you keep a, a set that's open, that you keep communications open, and that your team feels comfortable uh, as they're working through the day. Thank you. Yolanda, contact tracing. Sure. So contact tracing. Um, once you have a positive team member, the producer or your health safety supervisor is going to need to make sure to inform um, local and state um, authorities regarding the positive tests. And that should be in accordance with any prevailing local or federal laws, state laws, et cetera. And you should pay special attention to um, anything that would be specific to an international location. So while you are preparing your plans, you should make sure that you're aware ahead of time that you um, know what those requirements are from a legal standpoint of informing. The producer will then also um, collaborate with the health safety supervisor to document any individuals who were in close contact with the positive team member. And close contact is defined as all individuals who were within a six feet radius of the positive team member for more than 10 minutes. Start, um, so, and that would backdate to 48 hours prior to the symptoms um, being exhibited or to the positive test because in a lot of instances, um, we're hearing anecdotally, there are a lot of asymptomatic people. But to the extent that you're seeing um, or anyone exhibited any symptoms, you should contact trace back to 48 hours of any individuals who came in close contact with the positive team member. Um, so you should do that whichever is earlier, 48 hours before or upon receiving um, the positive test. And then um, after you have the test results, regardless of the test result, these close contact individuals um, should also gather their belongings and personal gear and be taken to the private location um, and advise that there's a team member that they've had close contact with who tested positive and then they should have a private um, transportation to go home. Um, that individual should then be tested and if there's a negative test result for them, the close contact individual will be required to quarantine in place for 
three days and then be retested to make sure that the negative is in fact a negative. If it's a positive test result, the individual um, may not return to the production until they're cleared by a doctor and complete two negative PCR tests three days apart. It's a lot, right? <laughs> um, so one of the things that we've been talk, uh, talking about with our, our friends who have been in production for a while is that, um, especially with some of these false positives, that they uh, made it really clear that it would be a great thing for all of us in pre-production to um, have replacement team members identified before you even start production. And so um, what, we're, what we're doing is looking at zone A, which again is the zone uh, that's gonna be in close contact with cast or with the set. And, um, and our recommendations are if the uh, person testing positive is in zone A and is the producer, the producer should already have a approved replacement that is in the same, um, following the same testing protocol so that they can immediately take over for the person that's being removed. Um, if the uh, person testing positive is a director on a feature film, then it's really gonna be up to the director and the DGA. Um, and if they have designated a, an approved DGA replacement, then that, D, that DGA replacement can be tested and brought on for the production. Um, if otherwise, if testing is upon retesting, the director is confirmed positive, the production must shut down. Um, and if the director's on an episodic series, those of you who have done episodic, you know, there's alternating directors and there's usually a producing, sometimes a producing director. So um, if you work with your, um, with the DGA and the producing director, there's probably a way to have each director have either the producing director be their replacement, approved replacement, or uh, a director from a prior or, a, or the next episode to come in and take over while you're retesting and confirming. Um, on an unscripted show, if it's a field producer on an unscripted show, that there can be a replacement that is set up that's approved by the EP to take over. Again, on unscripted shows, sometimes you might be out of the country or in multiple locations. So you have to take that into account when you're deciding who's gonna be the approved replacement. Um, next, a lead actor. So um, the producer and the director needs to make best efforts to work, shoot around the individual, just like if a actor came in that morning feeling sick and needed to go home and try to reboard, reschedule that day um, and try to work around um, until the actor is recovered and retested. If it's impossible to work around the leading actor, then the shooting crew and production would temporarily shut down. If it's the first AD on a film, the producer could bump up if there's a pre-approval, the first AD replacement from the second AD or, um, or someone from the AD team that's been pre-approved. Um, and so on. So have every one of your main critical heads of departments, everyone's critical, but especially your heads of departments, identify before you start your production, who is the pre-approved uh, replacement, make sure that they know that they have to follow the same protocols of testing um, and get approved by any unions if it's a union shoot. Um, and Jen's going to now talk about Shut, shutting down production. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, so, I mean, essentially think of it as your production COVID safety plan is ultimately designed to put these layers of risk mitigation into place so you don't have to get to the point of a shutdown. However, you being a responsible producer, <laughs> if you absolutely reach a situation where you have to shut down and you recognize it, that is that you being a responsible producer, right? So thank you for your commitment to safety. Um, one of the biggest things to consider when you're when you do have to go ahead and shut down production, you have to communicate with your casting crew. The more you communicate with them, the more they're going to be reassured about the steps that are being taken, what is happening with their jobs, when will they be able to come back. You don't want rumors to fly. You don't want them to guess. You want to be able to clearly communicate what is going to be happening, what is the process for how the show is going to shut down, anticipated, anticipating when it might be able to come back. So first step, as applicable, make sure you're applying the isolation, workplace sanitization, retesting, privacy and communication, and contact tracing, 
removal replacement protocols. Everything we just went through, if they're applicable, make sure they're applied and communicated. Let the crew know exactly when the shutdown begins and when production might potentially resume. Uh, inform team members how they will be notified when production resumes. Again, you don't want any guesswork in the process. You, you don't want that, you don't want the rumor mill to fly. Be on the offensive and make sure you're communicating to them what you intend to do. That will calm their fears. Allow employees to collect their personal belongings and secure their equipment and workspaces. They will not be allowed to return before production resumes. Be very clear about that. Um, I mean, there were, what, there were shows that shut down with camera packages just in sitting in trucks before. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling to think of ghost town when the initial shutdown happened. Mm. Um, make sure you understand how and why the initial COVID-19 COVID outbreak happened in the first place. Uh, change and implement new protocols necessary in order to prevent another incident. So that's evaluating your program. That's part of your safety plan is clearly something didn't work or there was a, a hole in the system. How can we prevent this from happening again? Ensure that all sets, locations, props, housing, dressing rooms, equipment, personal gear, and stages are secure and have been properly sanitized before returning and or turning back over to owners. And also make sure, making sure you're communicating with your vendors. Hey, we are gonna have to shut down uh, and, and have a plan in that, in that instance as well. What have you talked to your vendors about if you do have to shut down? Um, ask the cast and crew to quarantine in place for 14 days post shutdown. Repeat zone A and zone B testing protocols for starting back to work before allowing cast and crew to report back to work. So essentially start over again before you ramp up with your, your green light processes as far as getting people back to, back to work. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm gonna have, hey, Diana, can you set up? So um, in the packet that, that uh, PGA members will be getting in the next week or so, Notice I said or so now, not just the next week, <laughs> the next week or so. There'll be um, flow charts that will follow some of these documents. And we have a, a um, work in process red light protocol document. It's pretty small. I don't know if on your screen, but on my screen, it's pretty small. But we're going to also mirror these very uh, text heavy documents with some great flow charts that will allow you to, at a glance, be able to quickly remember what the protocols are. Um, and you can update these depending upon your production. Thank you, Diana. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee is saying, I'm hearing and seeing that nonfiction companies are using COVID as an excuse to lower rates that are already too low. Is there any recourse for this? Well, I would say that the best recourse is to not take the job. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, it really depends. I think it's a flow down from the networks and the studios, uh, mostly the networks that are uh, possibly not funding the COVID uh, protocol sufficiently and leaving the production with an insufficient budget. But there's no recourse um, that we have for it except your own personal negotiations. It's unfortunate. Uh, I, I think uh, for anyone brave enough to go out and start working under these conditions, it's ha it should be hazard pay. <laughs> that's, a, that's my personal opinion, but. Uh, I agree uh, and I, I would say that anybody doing that, that's an indication that they're probably gonna shortcut on their safety protocols anyway, if they're taking that kind of tact with it. I, I don't know that I'd feel safe working for them in the first place. Yeah, that's a good point, Yolanda. We, I have two projects starting up in the next, or starting the shooting process in the next couple of weeks. And on both of them, they're both unscripted. The unscripted seems to be the first shows that are going back, um, at least uh, as a rule, and because they're smaller productions. And on both of those, we've gotten, um, we've, at, we've been asked what the COVID costs will add to the budget. And we've been basically negotiated a pretty good, I think on one of them, it was a 15% bump on the entire production to cover COVID costs. So, um, so I think that, you know, talk to your producer if the rates seem to be low and ask them, you know, tell them that you, you know, feel like this is a hard time to get back to work, but you want the work and this is what you need and see if they will uh, comply or just work with producers who are willing to go fight for you. 
Um, uh, a question is, what if crew, a crew member is exhibiting symptoms um, and a, someone from the production team witnesses it um, and no one has called them out yet? I think that's your, your anonymous reporting, right? I don't know if that was in this document or not, but I mean, every, all the, the safety plan needs to include a system for anonymous reporting. And um, if you don't want to be the person to, to say, hey, I think you, you know, might be sick, you want to be able to have a hotline or, or a resource to call and say, hey, maybe check into this person. The, the, the important part um, that, uh, of this is that you have to have health and safety uh, supervisors or managers, and at least one of them has to be a medical personnel. Uh, if you don't have, and you should have a set medic. They, you need to have a producer or some kind of production person working with them. So they're not dealing with the minutia of the reports and the paperwork and the ordering supplies so that the medical personnel can be basically supervising your crew. And looking for signs like that so that they're the ones uh, calling people out and they're the ones uh, that, that notice when there's a, a medical uh, problem that needs to be addressed. But there might be a situation where, depending on how you staff it, if it's an off-production person and if it's one HSS, you know, and one set medic, depending, again, depending on your staffing, they can't put eyeballs on 150 people at one time. So, um, agree absolutely that you know that's part of the training is to be able to recognize the symptoms and I would suggest in the protocol that it's the medical personnel that the person reports to say hey can you go take a look at the person over in the shop and and just ask them a couple of questions and make sure they're okay and don't get close that's right. Right. <laughs> wear your Talk mask <laughs> Um, another question is, uh, on some places that you travel, your crew, there are, I, there are isolation and um, quarantine rules in those cities and states uh, or countries. For example, Canada is a two-week quarantine. Do we have to pay our crew for quarantining? Well, that's a negotiation. Yeah. I that's mean, I a negotiation with your crew. Um, and it should be in your pre, uh, we are providing along with the packet of protocol, some suggested budget um, uh, concerns that for you to look at. And one of them is how you're going to handle that. It's an individual thing. And it's something, like you said, for producers to negotiate with the production company and producers who are running a production to take it, keep in mind as they're building the budget. Yeah, I would say until the unions, guilds, studios put something out that mandates, uh, you know, pay for a quarantine period, it definitely should be part of the conversation. Absolutely mm -hmm. need to talk about it because it will come up. So again, be on the offensive and have your plan ready for how you're going to answer that. But, um, you know, it's going to have to be a negotiation. Um, uh, another anonymous has been reading that restrooms are a breeding ground for COVID-19. How is that going to be handled on a set or on location? Well, we suggest that you have a COVID cleaning crew um, that's there uh, working through the day, basically um, cleaning all contact surfaces like doorknobs. Um, it, it's recommended, uh, the, the recommendations are three times a day, but um, most companies are doing them on an hourly basis. So they would go through and clean. Uh, one of the other recommendations is in the bathrooms or restrooms, you have uh, sanitizing, uh, a sanitizer on the inside and outside of every door so that people sanitize on their way in, they sanitize on their way out. So that um, uh, every time you're contacting a surface, um, you're sanitizing before and after. And also try, uh, some big productions are retrofitting their uh, commodes with touch-free flushing, touch-free en touch entrance and exit. Um, and obviously on lower budget productions or if you're on location, that's harder. There, we also recommend that you have a zone A restroom for your cast and your zone A members that, um, and a zone B restroom. So they're separate uh, restrooms if at all possible. And I'd love to see touch-free just in general, like forever because yeah. you know, 
<laughs> like, I don't want to touch things anyway. It's amazing how well we are, right? You know, we're not getting sick as much as because we're not you know, <laughs> spreading around. Um, let's see. Uh, has anyone had any, uh, any experience with somebody uh, testing positive on a set yet? And where do the test, uh, the tests come that are the emergency tests? So you're doing tests during the morning, I guess, three times a day or once a week. Do we have to have tests on standby? Does the HSS have them? I haven't had any positives, but we are planning for that eventuality on some of our um, productions and uh, in order to be able to um, respond quickly and appropriately, we're making plans to have testing vendors available to us and in proximity close enough that we can quickly test the, you know, the um, close contact individuals and start making decisions based upon that. They still need to be PCR tests and, and, and tests that are approved by the guilds and unions. Some of the tests um, can give you a quick result and still be um, a, an approved methodology. But um, kind of the solution to that would be um, having a testing vendor that you're working with um, that can, can do that quick turnaround for you. Most tests have to be administered by medical personnel. Um, they're not valid unless a medical personnel gives them. So if you don't have the testing um, company standing by, your medic should be trained in giving the tests and perhaps you can make arrangements with the testing company to leave uh, some of the test kits with the medic so that they can be administered by them. Has anyone had any experience with contact tracing programs or procedures or technology? I mean, I was on a call, like, like unofficially, like literally was just on a call yesterday with um, one of the doctors that are talking to all the groups and um, they're developing an app where you would place QR codes around your set and people would scan throughout the day. Maybe that would work, maybe not, but you know, it's, it's a method. I, I, they're also saying that they're not the first one with this idea, so I think there are other apps out there, but I, I haven't seen any implemented or heard anyone. Um, and the challenge that you'll have with that, depending upon what location you're shooting, will be um, issues of privacy with people. They'll, some people are resistant to that. Some of the um, guild and unions are resistant to some of those technologies um, being applied to contact tracing. So um, it's kind of a push and pull to be able to make sure that you've identified everybody who's been a close contact while at the same time maintaining their privacy on and off production. I've also I'm, heard, oh sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm literally in the middle of the Johns Hopkins uh, contact tracing uh, training that uh, that they give. It's an online uh, training session, which I highly recommend to anybody who wants the information because it, it starts with uh, a large, uh, uh, a long, about an hour long um, presentation on the background of what uh, COVID-19 is, and then goes into all the details of contact tracing. It's, it's given by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health. So it, it it's really, it, it's actually free right now. Um, and uh, right. They, they're waiving the $50 fee for the test. So uh, Can you for send the us class. a link? Could you send us a link? Uh, sure. It's easy to find. It's Johns easy. Hopkins, Hopkins. Yeah. COVID, COVID contact tracing. Uh, All right. Uh, and, and you'll, it, it'll come up with it. It's taught through the Coursera um, uh, training system. But it's um, in terms of contact training, the, it's, the important thing is uh, the way it's presented, how you talk to people, um, and making sure they understand that it's completely confidential. You have to keep it confidential. Who have you been in contact with? Who have you worked? One of the things that um, you need to understand is we, we talked a little bit about it, but who have you been in close contact with for, uh, with, you try to stay six feet. It's, 
uh, let more than eight feet if they're singing or speaking very loudly. But um, for uh, 10 minutes is what we're using based on the union protocol. Uh, the CDC is 15 minutes to 30 minutes in close contact, but uh, 10 minutes is safer. Uh, so if you're in close contact with someone less than 10 minutes, it may not be considered a close contact. But um, it's really important for the person who is tested positive to provide that information you are going to make sure that they know it's confidential, that they're not going to be exposed, and that you're not going to expose anybody who has been in close contact. Um, as he said, people will resist. It's uh, especially uh, because they're afraid of, um, in a lot of cases, they're afraid of, the, um, uh, of being asked to leave work. But, yeah, I mean, um, that's, I think that's a, so two things. One, that's a question that I'd like for us all to talk about in a second, but the, just to add to that also, the recommendation is if you've been, if you've been in close contact, even for less than 10 minutes, but it's multiple times that day or mm -hmm. in the prior 20, 48 hours, you, that will also, if it adds up to 10 minutes, so if you've seen them twice for six minutes or four times for two and a half minutes, that's 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm doing my math. Um, so you want to um, you want to um, also make sure that if it's multiple contacts um, within 48 hours that you also make sure you're capturing that. How are we going to as producers keep? And I'm really asking this question. If somebody just doesn't show up, right? They we don't call them in because they tested positive, or we're, there's a new replacement all of a sudden. I, I it's very difficult for me to see how we how we dampen the talk that's going to go on on a set. Does anyone have any great recommendations for that? Well, you, you, to, again, a couple calls earlier this week. So the, mm -hmm. yes, for confidentiality, the employer cannot reveal, you know, who tested positive, but the individual can. That There's no issue with that. The individual could. Um, the other thing is if we're truly contact tracing and if we're saying you were working with these people and you need to isolate that team, that's, there's not just one person missing. There's a group of people missing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that kind of hides it too. Oh, uh, that's, you know, that's good. So. so part of the set dressing team might be just off on a little hiatus <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> um, oh, that's the other thing I think we, I skipped and when I was talking about it. If somebody from zone B uh, test positive. It's um, there. It's a little easier to keep the shooting main shooting unit going while you're dealing with the zone B, who are normally off in shops or production offices and things like that. So um, it won't. It it may not affect the main shooting unit as much as someone testing positive in zone A. Um, and uh, Richard and there's recommendations to have inner zones within those zones that then you can further isolate so that you're not um, without so many individuals once you have to do the contact tracing and potentially isolate those individuals. Right, Yolanda, thank you for pointing that out. We, in our guidelines, we recommend breaking the uh, zone A into A1, A2, A3, depending upon how close of contact they have with actual cast. Um, Richard Prince is asking, NBC is having people do a self-test for initial pre-employment tests for their shows in town, any thoughts? Well, it's one of the key things about testing is um, if you're self-testing, you have to self-isolate or self-quarantine from the minute you have the test until you report to work or the test doesn't mean anything. Um, that's, that's advice for individuals. Yeah, and I would ask Richard, a self-test meaning, I'm assuming you mean going to a place to get tested yourself, not actually yeah. doing this. Mm -hmm. I, that was yeah. my question. Yeah, there are no yeah. tests <laughs> right now that are approved. They're like the, I think Everly something test at home COVID test is not approved for use on in the entertainment industry. Um, there are certain ones, they, they really need to be administered by a medical professional. So if you're getting a medically professionally done, yeah sample taking then, um, and it's within 24 hours. Thank you, Jen, for laughing. Um, 20, if it's within 24 <laughs> hours of reporting for work, then
then I think that that, that probably NBC is looking at those things. Um, I go, going to, to NBC, they hand you a home test box and ask you to do the test and return it to a PA. No, so, so maybe it's the lower nasal. The lower one. Must it's, be the, yeah. It sounds Antigen like that's test. a self-administered. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I, yeah. I'm not I don't sure like that a lot. I think in our protocols, that isn't yet going to fly. Maybe there's some new, um, some new test that NBC has that we don't have access to yet that is, uh, that is as accurate as it needs to be for them. I mean, I think um, I've heard of some testing where, like, as long as a medical professional is um, observing, maybe, but, yeah. or like, there, but again, you got to have someone there. So, yeah. yeah. Maybe Richard, I wonder if it's because um, there's a company called Vault that they hand out, they can hand you a test um, and uh, you, you basically call and do a consult on Zoom and they tell you how to do the test and they make sure you're doing it right and then you send it back. Um, he said it's a self-administered nasal, nasal test companies. Let's get checked. All right. So we will, uh, we will check that out. I actually have heard, yeah, I've heard of them and I actually believe Let's get checked is on the approved vendor list. Don't quote me, but I believe they're on the approved vendor list for SAG. Great. Okay. Um, and uh, another how? thing to be mindful about okay. is that if you are in, in a lot of these situations, um, I'm aware of guilds and unions um, making inquiries of the producer of how they will compensate everyone for their time of being tested. So it's just something to be thinking about great i mean this the uh, i'm not trying to well i am finding a, a little flaw in that idea because they could take it home and somebody else could actually take the test and they could give it back to a pa and it's not even don't give anyone ideas no but i mean <laughs> that, i mean i would i would question the um right paying it for yeah. paying for the yeah. 30 seconds of a no swab I, right I, Well, again, seem. the timing of how a test works in relation to uh, being infected and being infectious is that once you have come in contact with someone and you're infected with the disease, it takes anywhere from three to 14 days for you for a test to be positive, for you to be shedding enough virus to, um, to be tested positive. So if you go out, if you do this test at home and your son goes to a party and comes home and he's infected, he passes it off to you, you know, you've had a negative test, but two days later you're infected by him, you go to work and three days after that you start to shed, you can be po uh, tested positive. So if you're the producer, you want to have more frequent as tests as frequently as you can, uh, so that um, you're catching those as soon as possible. And if someone's exhibiting symptoms, they're actually shedding up to two days prior to the first symptoms. So those two days, anyone that you've come in contact with could potentially have become infected. So the timing is really difficult. And if a test is being administered at home or, and you're not observing quarantine and care with the rest of your family members and the people you're coming in contact with, it does no good to the production, to, the, to yourself or the people you're working with. I, I suspect NDC probably has it in their policy that you're exposed to quarantine or self-isolate. Uh, after that, um, let's get checked is Yolanda. Thank you. It is on the SAG approved list. So that's it good. looks like Richard said that you do the test in your car. Oh, okay. You get home. Which but makes sense. That makes sense. That, yeah. that makes sense. Better. I think, I think we've heard about this test where you do it in your car and you, you turn it back in. I, yeah. I think I heard about and, that. Uh, and anonymous is asking, are you still doing temperature checks every day? We're recommending that if you don't do temperature checks as a screen for people to come on to, your set or into your stage places that people will self-report and fill out a health questionnaire before they get to production every day that goes to the health and safety uh, manager or supervisor. Any, 
Any uh, other questions? Well, just uh, one, one side note, uh, something I saw on uh, the temperature checks. Um, they, they can be uh, a false positive too. <laughs> Um, yes. If someone is gets dehydrated or comes in out of 105 degree temperature outside and then they're tested, it could. So you have to allow for the time to sit down, relax, drink a, you know, have some water and, you know, <laughs> get and, and check the temperatures as long as they're not feeling sick. I mean, it's, I heard uh, a show that they're they were in Atlanta and it's, you know, a bajillion degrees, kind of like it is here in LA now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they had to, they came up with like a, just a little AC tent for that same purpose because people were coming in and temperatures were high. So they're like, okay, go sit in this AC tent for a little bit and let's retest you, um, until you cool off. So. Um, someone's asking me, what's the liability of the production of crew lying on self check-ins? Are we relying on others to report? Well, I think we have codes of conduct and um, we are asking everyone on our productions to sign the codes of contact prior to, codes of conduct prior to employment so, and agree to them. So that's, that's a prerequisite to employment. I don't know about the legal liability question if anyone here does. I mean, I'm, I'm a very diligent producer. Uh, I, you try to keep good records, uh, especially under these conditions. That's one of the reasons to have all the paperwork and being uh, keeping it. And in fact, all of these questionnaires are part of the confidentiality. They don't go into uh, general reports, um, but they need to be kept. So the more diligent you are... Um, Some places you can't, though, legally. You can't keep them can't keep it yeah you can, you, you can say that you've you can say that you've kept them but it's got to be anonymous ag yeah. about who it is yeah. right uh -huh. you or have to you, you have the you've... right to observe them and get receive them to make sure someone's cleared to arrive at location or set but then in some places you're required to then discard it yeah or at least a checklist anything that you can do to show that you've been diligent is reason is uh, is reasonable and can help uh, limit your liability. Mm -hmm. um, and does anyone have anything to add or any anecdotes or stories you've heard from the field in terms of uh, red light protocols? Oh wait, how is all of this being noted on the PR? Oh, yeah, is all of, I, I think as you would any safety. Uh, Exactly. Again, uh, these kind of uh, the information and the, the names is all confidential. So uh, you would note that you had a positive test, that you held a safety meeting, and that you uh, dismissed a certain department or uh, into quarantine. You would not note, a, note any names. Um, that's all confidential information. And I, and I think, yeah, you, you keep it simple for the PR, but then as a reporting mm -hmm. call for insurance for the purposes of the production, I mean, I would personally keep just a separate record keeping of not just testing results, but everything that was implemented for that day to keep everybody safe. You know, we had this many hand washing stations, we had this many checkpoints, mm -hmm. you know, and that just like literally documenting day to day exactly right. what was in place, um, because that's all going to help you uh, with reporting. So. Yeah. I actually, and I, I would like to ask the group this question because in, in trying to imagine a, a scenario, um, uh, and especially the role that the producer plays, if somebody in zone A uh, is suspected and we the, the person is tested and it looks like they're testing positive, and let's say it's a, a camera operator or a focus puller or somebody like that that's really in the middle of zone A, so it's close to the actors, close to the director, close to the cameraman, um, it, a lot of times you would think it would be the role of the producer to alert those individuals, the key, the keys in zone A, that something has occurred. And that's that. And, and I, I, I would absolutely imagine the director or the cinematographer, the actor would say, who, who was it? Do, am I in, am, how close a con in contact were, was I with that person? And, and usually, you know, in normal circumstances, it, I mean, how many times have we as producers been the people that have put out the fires on the set, have, have calmed the situation down by having a relationship with the director or the stars 
that we can uh, assuage their their concerns. So, I think this is this this could be a really interesting scenario. I think most people you'd have in zone A yeah. would be willing to communicate their positive test with the people that they've been in close contact with because it is a tighter knit group, but it, it really has to be there. Uh, they have to agree to it. Can I ask a question? Like if, if Jen or Susan, maybe you know this, if, the, if, if my lead actress tests positive and, she's, and she says to me, I'm okay if you tell people, as the employer, can I tell people or I have to let it be somebody else? No, you wouldn't do it. You would let yeah. them communicate it. Okay. You so would not yeah. ever disclose they can't it. Come. They can't come to the set and say, I'm positive. I'm positive. Yeah. And by the way, we've, we've moved them <laughs> off the set so quick. They're, yeah, they're gone. Exactly. They're, they're, not, they're not anywhere near the set. They've been. And look, as a practical matter, everyone's going to know because you, what you have to disclose is that someone has tested it's positive. positive. Yeah. So they'll know that the person who disappeared, they'll surmise that, but mm -hmm. you cannot disclose their name. They, they obviously, it's up to them, could email people, but you can't ask them to do it, nor can you disclose their name. Okay. One last question, and then we're going to say goodnight to everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. If you have any other questions, send them to info at producersguild.org. If you have any great tips or notes from the field, send them to info at producersguild.org. And if you have something you'd like to share with the team, let us know. And uh, we're looking for guest speakers. So last question, how often are you having breaks so everyone can take off their masks in zone A? I mean, I think we're recommending what? Every, every couple hours or so. I mean, you really, it gets exhausting. And especially for that, that tight uh, zone A group, you gotta let them get out of there. You gotta let them air out and be in a safe zone where they can space themselves out and, and take their masks off. And that's gotta be worked into the, the shooting time of your day is the mask break, is the airing out of the set, all of that just for people's mental sanity of just being able to breathe some air and get out of the workspace. Um, and, yeah, and yeah. SAG, yeah, SAG is really driving that as well in terms of ventilation. It's one of the things that they're going to look at really um, with a fine tooth comb with a magnifying glass in your COVID safety plan, which is how are you ventilating your spaces, including your sets. So having a once an hour or once every two hours mask break that also gets your team out and you can either air out the space or bring in blowers and blow out the space or you know, scrub the air with these specialized air scrubbers. That's, that's what they're going to look for in your plan. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. Have a great evening. Um, and thank you guys all here for answering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night. Bye. See you Good night. next thank week. You.